All right, good morning, everyone. All right, that was decent because it's so early in the morning. Yes, sorry for waking everyone up, but uh, apparently we had to come and do an early morning presentation. So my name is Will the Chill, and some of y'all may know me by my legal name, Will Braswell. I am uh, with the Austin Pearl Mongers from Austin, Texas. And also uh, my company, Auto Parallel Technologies, which is a, a Perl programming company, of course. So today uh, we're going to be talking about the cloud, whatever that means. Um, specifically, we're going to talk about auto parallel programming in the cloud or on the cloud or however you want to consider that analogy. So. Uh, Anybody that saw me present last year would remember that I tried to make the world's uh, shortest PowerPoint by only having uh, one slide. So that's the end of the PowerPoint. There you go. Okay, um, moving on. What is the cloud? Uh, and I'll just talk for a moment. We don't have an actual slide for this because this is a live coding presentation for the most part. Yay! Um, but uh, I, uh, I wanted to talk for a moment about what is the cloud. And uh, I'll just put a placeholder uh, uh, website up here just so that everyone can see our cool picture of Rody the Roadrunner while I'm talking. And uh, we'll talk about our Pearl in just a moment. But first, what is the cloud? The cloud, the cloud, the cloud. The cloud, like there's one cloud that's just hanging over our heads at all times or like uh, the entire atmosphere of the planet Earth is somehow charged with digital information magically now. What does it mean? Okay, I'm just curious. Anybody who here, anybody here who considers yourself to be a cloud programmer and you actually know what that means and it's different than being a regular programmer, raise your hand. No cloud programmers? Okay, well I have my hand up so I count I guess. Well, that's good. Um, in order to really understand what the cloud is, we have to go back a little bit in history to about 15 years ago when there was a, another very similar and related concept called the grid. Does anybody remember the grid or even just the term grid a little bit? This was mostly in academia. This is when I was in college and I was working for the uh, Supercomputer Center at Texas Tech University and um, programming their Linux computers there and, and using some Perl as well along the way. Um, so we, we were working on uh, building a cooperative system among a number of educational institutions in America and abroad um, using this term, the grid, or just a grid. Kind of similar to how we talk about the cloud versus a cloud. And it does mirror that definition, as you'll see in a moment. So, essentially, um, the grid was a combination of uh, computing on demand. So, in the same way that nowadays we can just spin up an, a virtual machine instance, um, in, a, in a matter of moments on any number of websites. Uh, so taking that ability to do computing on demand and then combining it with utility pricing, okay? Like how we pay for water and electricity or internet in a utility uh, billing fashion. So there were a couple uh, companies early on that uh, tried to create grid solutions and I, I used most all of them in my official capacity working as a programmer at the Supercomputer Center. Um, there was a um, Sun Grid Engine, which was very expensive but advanced and ultimately a commercial failure uh, through, of course, Sun. And there was um, one called Globus that was like a, a public uh, sort of GPL type open source uh, version. There was another, uh, probably the most advanced one that was called Avaki, originally called Legion. And, um, and uh, Texas Tech actually did 
buy a license to that and we got to use it. And essentially what the grid allowed us to do is to take all of our computers at Tech, Texas Tech, which was a whole bunch of PCs in the library and a whole bunch of uh, supercomputers like the math department owned one and the computer science department owned a few and the physics department owned one. So we went and we installed this grid software on all these different computers, several hundred computers, and connected them all up and then were able to actually use them as one massive super duper computer. And that was all within Texas Tech University's campus. So that was called Tech Grid. I helped to build Tech Grid. Um, and I probably was about 16 years old at the time. Then we took Tech Grid and connected it to the other universities that had also built their own uh, grid systems and this was uh we had one group called hipcat high performance computing across texas which was like texas tech and ut and uh several other texas universities there was also um you guys may recall a um, term or a group called internet 2 and this was sort of uh, an attempt to create high speed linkages between the global sites of these grids Okay, and yes, this all very much has to do with the question of what is a cloud? Because we're actually telling you how the cloud was born, which I'm guessing most people don't have any idea about because you weren't there doing it with us. Unless you were, and in which case you should have already raised your hand when I asked who's a cloud programmer. Um, the term grid eventually went away because of um, a schism within the community, which we know a little bit about here in the Pearl community. Essentially, there was two types of grids, which is similar kind of in a way to that we have clouds now or the usage of clouds, but there was a compute grid that was essentially a, a uh, conglomeration or pooling of memory and CPU resources. And then there was a data storage grid, which is a glorified NAS or, you know, uh, a gigantic hard drive, essentially. And as I'm sure you can imagine, having a gigantic hard drive is very useful, and we all have that now with our online storage and even flash drives and whatnot. But having a gigantic computing power is much more impactful to humanity when you consider things like uh, those universities that are trying to cure cancer and run simulations for the benefit of all mankind. And that was what we were trying to, of course, affect by having all these universities building the grids together. Unfortunately, the compute grids never took off. Nobody ever really was able to use them for one critical reason, which is, again, one of the things that I'm here to tell you guys about now. It was too expensive and difficult to write a lot of parallel code to run on these extremely heterogeneous systems because it wasn't just like one MPI system or one pthread system or one open MP system. It was like everything mixed together in this gigantic mishmash of the grid. And that's where auto parallel programming comes in, which is part of the name of today's presentation and also part of the name of my company, Auto Parallel Technologies or Aptech for short. Uh, so what we saw about 10 years ago was essentially a complete dying off of this really awesome technology of compute grids. And I had mentioned this one software called Legion slash Avaki. That software is amazing. And maybe someday we'll be able to go back and use it. And you know what? It's written in Perl. It's like a million lines of Perl. And it's so friggin' slow. But once it runs, it's got like a five minute spin up time or something crazy. But once it starts up, it allows you to do some pretty amazing things that even Amazon in their AWS and advanced other cloud systems are still trying to kind of catch up with what Avaki and Legion were doing 15, 20 years ago in Perl, super slow Perl. We've got our Perl now to speed that up, which I will also mention in a minute. Back to the cloud. We're still wondering, where did the cloud come from? Well, everybody that needed a gigantic hard drive had the data storage grids to use after the compute grids kind of fell by the wayside. And the commercial attempts at doing the grids failed. Avaki went out of business. Sun got bought out, and their Sun Grid engine never was a commercial success. However, we did eventually see some new technology that helped us move back 
and rebrand the grid as the cloud. And that technology is like the virtual machines and container technology that makes Amazon and other cloud systems very easy and quick to use now. So you don't have to do like I did, which spending months installing Avaki and Globus and da-da-da by hand on hundreds of systems. We don't have to do that anymore. You can click one button and Amazon will give you a hundred uh, CPUs or a thousand CPUs or whatever you want. And it is running using the utility billing because you only get charged when you start up the CPUs and then you spin them back down again. So it's like a per minute or per hour type billing. So that definition of grid, compute grid and data storage grid does actually directly apply to the cloud. So what is the cloud? The cloud is essentially the rebranded, recombined technologies of the compute and data storage grids. It's computing on demand at utility billing. So that was my long-winded way of giving you a definition for what the cloud is, because if I didn't, then the rest of this talk would be kind of confusing and meaningless. What is the cloud? The cloud is a rebranded version of both the compute and data storage grids, which provides compute resources on demand at utility billing. That's the definition of the cloud by somebody who's standing here in front of you that helped to build this technology from scratch. And I'm gonna show you some more cool from scratch cloud stuff that I've built here in a moment. So, R Pearl. What is R Pearl? Who here knows what R Pearl is? Hopefully at least a few of you do. Okay, good. Then you probably already either love me or hate me if you had your hands up just a minute ago. But R Pearl stands for I don't know what, Revolutionary Pearl, Restricted Pearl, Roadrunner Pearl, you can choose your own interpretation, but it, uh, R Pearl is the Pearl compiler, okay? So this is if you want to either protect your intellectual property or if you want your code to run fast. And since I personally am uh, partial to free and open source software, I'm not too concerned with protecting my IP, although, maybe some of uh, you know your corporate clients and customers are concerned about that. For me, and everything I just talked to you about, all has to do with performance, right? I care about speed above all else. This is what computing was originally and is still supposed to be about. Whoever has the fastest, most powerful hardware and software, you have to have both, that person is king, all right? Um, if, if you only have fast hardware, you're going to have a bunch of commercial failure like we saw with the, the grid. And if you only have a bunch of software, then you're going to have uh, slow solutions, even if it's the world's shiniest solution. So I care about both. And I'm extremely loyal, as I'm sure you guys can tell. Uh, year after year, I'm here in uniform representing uh, high ideals and also representing high performance and I'm loyal to Pearl which is why I spent the last six or seven years now working on the R Pearl compiler. What does R Pearl do? R Pearl takes your Pearl 5 source code at some point we'll support Pearl 6 we don't need to worry about that today but we take your Perl 5 source code as input, do a whole bunch of magic on that, and we generate C++, and then, of course, a binary file as the output. So if you want to keep your own C++ and read the source code and see what Perl looks like compiled, you sure you can do that. But probably what you care about is compiling your PM files into .so or .dll files, and what you probably care about is compiling your .pl files into a.out or exe files. And that's what you're going to get to see here today. And that's, that's what rperl does. Okay, so rperl is a compiler. Um, I'll also talk uh, briefly about uh, another software that is one of the rperl application suites. This is called Math Pearl, and um, essentially, I have started writing Physics Pearl and Math Pearl. I've only got a few algorithms and applications done in each because, of course, physics and math are 
seemingly infinite in complexity. And I'm a scientist, so this is, this is why I'm doing all this, so that I can run simulations and do physics and math for the benefit of mankind. And build cool things like we see in Star Trek. Um, I gotta check. Beam me up, Scotty. Scotty? No, okay. Still not working. At some point, this com badge will work. At some point. And yes, I did have to earn this. It's not a freebie. Space badge. Look it up. So, Math Pearl is an application suite. Essentially, I just started writing random math algorithms using R Pearl, okay? And we're going to look at one of them. Uh, let me see if I can kind of zoom this in a little bit for the benefit of the viewers. Um, woo, okay, that might be too much. So uh, there is a linear algebra algorithm called Gauss-Seidel. And this is used for solving a series of linear equations, if I remember correctly. Um, and you can see the math here. So yeah, this is, a, this is actually a PL file in this case. Uh, usually I show PM files, but since we're about to do something special with it, it's a PL file. Um, essentially, we're just initializing an array to a certain size and then looping over it with these three nested loops and then doing some arithmetic on the inner loop. So you should be able to just kind of look at this and know what I'm trying to convey to you without needing to worry about why you should use Gauss-Seidel in your everyday lives, which maybe you shouldn't if you're not a mathematician or a scientist. But it is an important algorithm that exists in math and we care about it in the sense that it does something real. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna run this. Let's see. This is gonna be an adventure of me toggling between screens and figuring out how to get my code up on the correct screen here. So you'll have to bear with me as I uh, as I do this. All right. So let's see if I can move this terminal over like that. And then I'm going to have to zoom in. Oh, you know what? This son of a gun is so hard to see. Now that I realize that, I have to uh, huh, edit the settings real quick because it's impossible to see otherwise. Where is my font size? I can barely see it. There it is. Come on, nine point font. Can't you guys see that in the back of the room? Okay, that's still a little bit too small. I thank the home viewers for bearing with us. Okay, can you guys see that now? It's right up here, Cloud Web Zero. I hope so. Is there a way to turn it on bold? Maybe that'll help. Okay. That's as good as we're getting, guys and gals. Okay. So, this is my cloud server. I've got a couple of them, and I've been through a couple different hosting providers that I'll uh, just say two of them have utterly failed me and caused me to have to restart over from scratch, which is really annoying, but I will say that I do have a good hosting provider in Dallas now, and if anybody wants a recommendation, I can give it afterwards. So, this is my uh, cloud-web0 is simply the name of the server, and we are going to try and run that Gauss-Seidel program. So, which rperl, so rperl is installed there. Um, I'm going to turn on the uh, extra messages here, just so we can kind of see more of what RPL is doing while it's running. And boy, maybe I can turn this whole podium, because otherwise I'm going to stretch my neck out. I'm trying to turn and look constantly here. 
Okay, that's a little bit better. So if I were simply to do a uh, regular Perl dash V, oh my goodness, we see what version of regular Perl we're running. What is up with this microphone? Is it gonna stay? There's regular Perl, Perl 5221, okay? So now if we do R Perl dash V, this is a completely different program, okay? Takes a minute because it has to bootstrap its own self by compiling. There we go. So we saw a whole bunch of stuff flash by here that I'll scroll back up to. That's kind of a big compilation statement there. I don't know if you guys can see that, but this is a this is one G plus plus command right there. Um, and you can kind of see buried in the middle of it right here. There's a C plus plus eleven flag which is critical because it was possible but impractical to build RPERL before 2011 um, due to the limitations of C++. Um, the reason why we have to use C++ is because it's binary compatible with C, and C is what the Perl 5 core is written in. So you have to be able to be binary compatible with the Perl core or else it doesn't work at all. Um, C itself is of course, not quite as powerful as C++, and C++, using the older standards, is uh, too limited to implement even a subset, really, of Perl. But C++11 has some really cool new features, and C++14 as well, that allow us to do that, um, including smart pointers, which uh, does garbage collection in C++, and also um, the uh, standard unordered map data structure, which allows us to emulate a Perl HV or hash value, etc. So uh, we can also see what version of our Perl we're running, which is 3601, and that is the latest version off of GitHub. Or I'll just probably start saying Git from now on. That's the latest version on Git. And forget I just said that other H part of the word. Um, although I was trying to update all my code to Bitbucket and GitLab before I got here, and of course that did not happen fast enough. But our Perl is on GitLab, and it was on day zero, for those of you that know what I'm talking about. Um, all right, so that was just me running our Perl dash V. Now we're going to actually uh, run that Gauss Seidel program that I mentioned, all right? Don't you guys wish I was just going through PowerPoint slides and reading my own words to you? That would be so awesome, wouldn't it? Sorry I didn't put the time into building a PowerPoint deck. I know I'm such a lazy bum. Uh, okay, so let's see, where is Gauss Seidel? That is in Math Parole. All right, so uh, first if I just run the uh, program, the Gauss Seidel program without an RPerl uh, prefix. This is kind of like when you run a PL file, you don't have to always type Perl space and then something.pl because you have the hash bang, right? And this is the same thing here. So um, I can do it like this. Oh, there's some, okay. What we just saw was not my fault. That is some bizarre, wacky artifact. I think of this USB connector that causes the screen to flash like that. And let's just hope it doesn't do it a whole bunch of times. Did you see that camera guy? I'm blaming that on y'all somehow. Okay, he raised his hand, he took responsibility. Um, let's see what happens when we run Gauss Seidel. Uh, Actually, let's, see, let's actually edit this real quick first because I remember, oh my goodness, this syntax highlighting will give me a stroke. I just remembered that I need to change the uh, size of the run here the first time, otherwise it will be running on a thousand iterations and we don't want that just yet. That's for when we have it compiled. Okay, uh, let's run this puppy in regular Perl mode and actually, now that I say that, I need to give one more quick preface. Our Perl has three modes, okay? Um, there's regular 
Perl ops, Perl types mode, which is what we're about to run right now. And this is where uh, it's running at one times the speed of normal Perl because it is running using normal Perl. There's also a medium speed mode, which is when you have um, Perl types but C++ operations. And uh, that usually runs about like the in the order of magnitude of 10x. So 10 times the speed of normal Perl. But I don't really care about that medium speed mode right now, or medium magic mode as I call it. And uh, obviously the low speed, low magic mode is what we already have. So we don't care too much about that in any special way. What we do care about and what we'll see in a minute after we do this one is the high speed mode, which is uh, C++ operations and C++ types. But first, the 1x mode. And we see here that it did a bunch of math and spit out a bunch of stuff that we don't even care about, except that we're just going to assume that the numbers are correct. And uh, scrolling back up to the top here, you can see that um, this helper functions, which is our bootstrapping I mentioned a minute ago, skipped over itself because it was already done, because it caches its own compiled files. And then it started running here with the initial values and then after several iterations, because it is an iterative algorithm, an approximation iterative algorithm, it came up with this final answer. And we could increase the number of iterations and so forth, but that's, that's a very close approximation of the actual answer. This just ran at one times the speed of normal Perl. So you could actually kind of like see the, the number scroll by there briefly as it was running. It's fast, but it's, you know, Perl is not made to be a uh, mathematical high performance language in that sense, okay? But our Perl is. So let's see what happens when we uh, run it with the R Perl command. And I'm gonna actually put a dash T, which means um, we're just gonna test it only. We're not gonna actually do a full execution right now. You'll see now our Perl stuff is happening. Oh, it did do an execution, but it executed it in the uh, 1x speed mode, but not in the compiled mode. So I'm scrolling back up. This is what just ran. This is the output of Perl. It shows a bunch of uh, R Perl, rather, a bunch of R Perl settings, and then it shows this section here, which is kind of the, um, you know, what is R Perl doing? Okay, first it's looking up the dependencies, then it's doing a three phase parsing, um, which is a normal Perl check, then it's uh, running through Perl Critic, and finally it's running through an R Perl parser, which has its own grammar. And then it's generating the R Perl code, which is the C code, and then finally it's running that. Although in this case, because it's a test mode, it's not actually doing the C++ part. I just wanted to show you what it looks like when we're in test mode. Now let's go into actual C++ mode, which I just delete this T. And there's the G++, and it is compiling another gigantic big we use about every option that G++ has, no joke. We're pushing the limits of compilers. And there you go. We didn't put a bunch of print statements to flash by, but we did see that the final number 131.863 is that same uh, approximation that we saw a moment ago in Perl. And we can fiddle with the uh, significant digits and all that. Trust me, it's all there. This is just a demo. But what we just saw was compiling Perl code into C++, having that C++ pass to this gigantic G++ command, and then running that binary code. Let's do that again. Um, and this time, I can just click the up arrow. But instead of running the .pl, there's no dot .anything on that, because in Unix, we don't put uh, suffixes on executable files. In fact, what I'll do is I'll run the command file, and it's going to tell us that this is an ELF 64-bit executable, okay? So this is an actual, you know, exe file for you in the Windows world. 
So let's go ahead and just run that one directly again just to prove to ourselves that we're not crazy. And I mean, it's so fast, it's, it seems instantaneous, but yes, it, it did run, okay, and give us that output. Now let's just, for funsies, uh, go back and turn on the longer runtime, which instead of five iterations of 10 by 10 array, we'll do a thousand iterations of a 2500 by 2500 array. Several orders of magnitude difference. I didn't even calculate how many orders of magnitude, but quite a few. So we're going to uh, recompile this again. I'm not going to run it in the 1x speed mode because we'd still be here waiting for it to run. But I'm going to compile this again. And then it's going to run again. And we're going to see how fast it runs. By the way, obviously, compile time is fine if you have a fast run time. So now it's running. Oh, and it should take, ooh, actually, this one might take about two minutes now that I realize it. We'll leave that one running for a moment while I talk about the next point, which is what we're about to segue into. This code, actually, I can, uh, let me see something. This code is running right now on one processor, which I will show you by giving you a new view here. Okay, this is a program called HTOP, and you can see I have four cores on this machine, and only the fourth core is being pegged right now. So I have three completely idle, empty, lazy cores that are doing nothing at all and costing me money for no dang reason. Freeloaders. So, um, in fact, I don't even want to wait really to see that one finish running because I'm too impatient. So I'm going to kill that and we're going to see that uh, stops the process, so we're back down to zero processors being hit here. What we're going to do now is talk briefly about auto-parallelization, which is super important to the future of computing and which is extremely complicated. And I've spent my entire adult life and more trying to figure out exactly how to at least get a handle on this. And I've done a lot of work myself from scratch. I did some work in grad school for computer science. And, and now I've got our Perl and we've uh, built auto parallel abilities into R Perl which I'm going to show you guys how that works. It's pretty cool, and I've never demoed this to anybody before, so y'all are the first. And it does work, at least last night it did. So, um, there is a program called PolyCC, and this is actually a suite of many different programs. And some of you may uh, recognize the uh, CC part of PolyCC as being sort of a compiler collection Okay, like GCC, the GNU compiler collection, or the GNU C compiler, depending on how old you are or how long and gray your beard is. Um, so, yes, we have quite a cool beard in the room. Um, so, PolyCC is the um, polytope compiler collection. And a polytope is a multidimensional data structure that represents computational dependencies and data dependencies through time. And I did not invent this math. This math is like, you know, doctoral thesis math from several French dudes uh, a couple of years back. And you can look them up. Um, um, but essentially, a, what you do is you analyze a program, you build this polytope representation of the program, and then you do some special um, linear algebra style transformations like shearing or 
rotating or s splitting these polytopes in some way that allows you to determine which parts of the program can be executed in parallel um, without breaking those time and computation and data dependencies. And this is very complicated. I mean, this is something where many people have done many PhD theses on this thing to get to the point where we have a program called PolyCC. PolyCC is a collection of Pluto, Klug, um, there's a clan, uh, there, it's, uh, there's like 20 different softwares that are made from different people all brought together in this PolyCC program. And we need them all because they're all super complicated and important. And our Perl knows how to use PolyCC. That's part of our Perl's trickery and magic. PolyCC only runs on C code. It doesn't even really run on C++ code. So actually, I have to like fool it into thinking that R Perl is outputting C code. But it works. And we're actually going to see it work now, which is pretty amazing. And I'll tell you what we're going to do before we do it. We're going to run the R Perl command again with the dash P flag, which means parallelize. And I know I put it turned off by default, which seems lame, but it's because it's still experimental. It will be turned on by default in the future because everybody in this room should have a laptop newer than mine, which is like 11 or 12 years old. And even this one has two cores in it. So everybody should have at least two to four to eight cores in your laptop at this point. You would want parallelism turned on by default in all your code, all right? So let's go ahead and compile again. But this time, we're going to put that dash P in there. And we're going to do a no execute as well, because I don't want it to try and run automatically. I think there's a few glitches I'm still working out. OK, and we just saw something flash by real quick, which I'm going to have to scroll back up to in a minute. But we're once again back on our gigantic G++, OK, which we can see is pegging one processor because G++ is a serial, you know, process. There it's finished. So that, that finished our compile. But I got to scroll up here because something flashed by here real quick. Look at this stuff. Ooh, some Pluto output and, and a parallelized step. That step. It was not in the previous R Perl run that we saw. Um, now it is generating open MP code. And we can see, actually, in my debugging, uh, because I turned on the debugging, this is the call to polycc. There's user local bin polycc. And we're passing it our CPP output file, which we generated up here in the generate and save phases of the R Perl compile. So R Perl took the R, uh, Perl 5 code, the PL file, generated a .cpp file, passed that CPP file to polycc. Then polycc created a file called gaussseidel.openmp.cpp. So it inserted this .openmp into the file name. Here's the polycc output for those of you that are really curious about how this parallelism thing works. Oh, there's the glitch, and we're back. Whew. Um, but there's Pluto. I had mentioned Pluto running. Um, here's some dependency, loop dependencies, uh, tiling. It does this polytope tiling that I had mentioned, finding dependencies, and doing scheduling, and finally writing that output file. Then, that openmp.cpp file is the one that we actually compile with G++. Okay? And all of this leads us to wanting to look at what files we now have compiled, because what in the world do we have at this point? The answer is we have a gauss uh serial version, which is one we ran a moment ago, and it was taking too long, and I canceled it. We have a gauss-seidel.pl, which is our original uncompiled input file. 
We have a gaussidle.cpp, which is the serial output file that we passed into PolyCC a moment ago. And ignore the manual files, those are used for my debugging. Um, and then we have the openmp.cpp, which was the output of Pluto. And finally, we have one more executable file, gaussidle.openmp. This is our binary file that is automatically parallelized and we're about to run. And when this works, and if it works, and if we see something cool happen in HTOP, it would be nice if everyone applauded because this is insanely complicated. This is my way of crossing my fingers and saying if it doesn't work, okay. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and run this program. And remember, this is 2,500 squared times 1,000 iterations. And it's the gauss-seidel.openmp. In fact, if we run the command file on that again, we'll see it's another 64-bit executable. So here we go. Drum roll. Da -da 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 -da. Running. And all four processors pegged to the top. You have no idea how many years I've worked to do that stupid thing of compiling Perl and forcing it to automatically parallelize. And it should take only about 25 seconds, according to my uh, timings last night, to run this. So um, as soon as we see that drop back off again, I'll switch back and we will see the actual math output because right now it's not showing us any output, it's just running over there. Um, and I'll mention briefly, oh, there it goes. This is using OpenMP. Sorry for the constant change in volume here, but this microphone is wacky. Uh, there's our output. It's got uh, actually a tremendous amount of significant digits because it's a huge number, but, but it's there. And if we wanted to change the uh, printf formatting, we could see a, a ton of numbers. So we just compiled Perl into a auto parallelized binary and y'all are the first people to ever see that and this is what I would consider cutting edge Perl. Now we're gonna have to do something really cool and fast and zip through my other awesome new thing that I've built which is an entire new cloud. Yes, I built my own cloud from scratch. It's called cloudforfree.org, and y'all can actually go there right now if you want. Um, you can see there's a couple other people that have logged in here, and uh, right now I have you logging in with Git. That other pesky Git that is having some issues right now, but I'm, uh, I'll have Bitbucket live, and, and I'm implementing GitLab logins, so those, those are almost done. You'll be able to click login with GitLab and login with Bitbucket as well, okay? But let's go ahead and click this button right here. Ding, login with git blank. And there I am. So there's my git h account. And the only thing I really care about right now, because this is alpha, beta, gamma, delta, I don't know. It's some kind of level of pre production, but if you click on the code editor and zoom in, you can see we have a fully functional, mostly fully functional code editor here. And we can actually look through our example code samples through the learning R Perl, uh, which are re-implementations of the exercises in learning Perl. So we've got only a few minutes left, but you can see this code here, quite simple, should um, execute and show us a, uh, circumference of a circumference of a circle with any radius. So you get to input the radius and it just calculates the, you know, two pi radius. There it is right there, the actual math. Um, but first, let's run a syntax check. This is that special R Perl syntax check, okay? And uh, there it said, oh, and we're back. There you can see no syntax errors were found. Um, and this is using uh, that multi-parse uh, 
uh, strategy that I had pointed out before. So you can see this is actually running our Perl, like I was doing in the terminal, okay? Um, this is just testing the R Perl syntax because it's not only a Perl or a Perl critic check, it, it does have an actual R Perl grammar. So if we just wanted to, uh, for example, I believe in normal Perl, oh, you're killing me. Good thing we're near the end of the thing here. I believe in normal Perl you would be um, allowed, oh, where's my scroll bar? You would be allowed to, oh goodness, delete that semicolon, okay? And that would, I believe, be um, removing a single semicolon would be okay in normal Perl, but it's not okay in R Perl because actually it's not okay in C++. So we can see that it actually says there was a syntax error found, it had a compilation error, and um, uh, this was near the print command, okay? So we're just seeing that it is actually running an, a real R Perl syntax check here. And the other thing that we care about, which we're now near the end of our time, is uh, running, running the job, which I'll show you here in a minute. Um, but first I'll mention that this is a really cool editor that does obviously have Perl, um, abilities and it has VI and Emacs and a normal editing mode and it has uh, this um, file explorer here which is called Apache 2 file manager and um, I've been able to um, adopt about half a dozen different CPAN distributions just during the building of this software <laughs> um, including that file manager software and incorporating it into here. So um, I could uh, definitely use some help on this because there's actually feature incomplete. There's no save button. I, I haven't gotten far enough to click the save button yet, okay? But, you know, somebody can come help me with this. There's a lot of JavaScript here. I'm not really a JavaScript programmer, but I have to be in order to do this. It's a tremendous amount of JavaScript in the front end. But let's see it actually run something here during our last few minutes. Remember that we just had the um, code up there to show us a circumference of any radius. So what we're going to do here is simply submit this as a new cl uh, cloud job. It's going to run with Rperl in the background and come back and give us the answer. And in this case, for the sake of simplicity and because it's still a pre-production system and I don't want people doing some crazy stuff, um, I have hard-coded us into a uh, testing mode with uh, parallelization turned off, no parallelization. So obviously I could go into the source code and fiddle with that, which I was planning to do if I had time, although we probably won't. But let's at least see a serial code run, okay? Because we, we did just a moment ago see that the parallel works, but let's see, let's see it in serial on the cloud. And this is another one of these things where if it gives us the right answer, we're all gonna clap and cheer because of the insane amount of work to do something that seems simple but is not. So, here we go. This is the other big part of the demo that we hope works. And it's actually running live terminal emulation. There we go, running. And it's giving us a prompt, please input radius. So this is actually a terminal emulator that I wrote that is essentially giving us the same thing as if we were in our shell a moment ago. So I'm just going to say the radius is going to be, oh, yeah, okay, there we go. You can see the numbers pop up as I type them. 2,112.23. And that's giving live characters back and forth. So when I type it, it appears down below on my local machine, but it has to actually go to the cloud and come back before I see it appear there. This is a live terminal. And here we go. Once again, drum roll please to see if I get the correct answer or any answer at all. The answer is apparently 13,271. Thank you everyone. <laughs> and this concludes our presentation of auto parallel programming on the cloud. My name is Will the Chill. Please come see me afterward if you have any questions. Thank you.